big picture where does kubernetes stand right now what does the ecosystem look like what are the major challenges faced by people adopting kubernetes and what's really going on in the project itself and finally we will also talk a little bit about what is new in kubernetes 1.24 so let's get started a little bit about me uh, my name is nikita and i'm a staff engineer at vmware uh, my day job luckily is to work on the kubernetes project itself and i've been working on it for over 4 years now i was also a former member of the kubernetes steering committee it is a committee which oversees the governance of the whole project so we have different levels and committees and groups in the community and the steering committee is the topmost body which like is the leadership takes the leadership role for the whole project uh, i also hold a few other roles in the community like being a technical lead for a sig related to automation called sig contributor experience and i'm also a cncf ambassador you can find me on github uh, the username nikita and twitter at the nikita uh, okay enough about me let's get back to kubernetes uh, let's look at some of the recent kubernetes trends that we've seen in the ecosystem in the cncf annual survey we noticed that there's 96% of organizations are either using kubernetes or they're evaluating kubernetes which honestly is at an all time record high ever since the survey started so before kubernetes was something like okay this is a very niche technology that only some companies can use only one of the bigger companies or medium sized companies use the smaller companies they don't need to use it but now it definitely shows that kubernetes has crossed that adoption chasm to become a mainstream global technology it is everywhere we also noticed a 67% increase in the number of developers using kubernetes and that number is now a whopping 5.6 million developers just think like there are five almost 5.6 million people like you working on kubernetes itself all across the world now at the same time another very interesting fact that stood out in these surveys was that a significant portion of the backend developers said that they've never heard of kubernetes and they're not sure what it is so it goes on to show that developers may not even realize that many of the popular services they use use kubernetes under the hood it's become somewhat like linux right now so somewhat like the ubiquity of linux right now this shows that kubernetes is finally becoming boring and honestly that's good for the project and also for the ecosystem because that's what exactly kubernetes should out to do surely there's more to do but we are getting there along the same thoughts kubernetes is becoming less visible as the technology evolves organizations are using serverless they are using managed services more intensively than in the past and users now don't necessarily need to know about the underlying container technology In fact, we even see that seventy-nine percent of respondents use certified Kubernetes-hosted platforms, and ninety percent of them leverage some form of cloud-managed services at some point or the time. We can also see that with Kubernetes mentions in social media, that the mentions are increasing year on year. The hype is still there; it's not gone yet. The adoption also is also increasing. The hype is also increasing. another very interesting thing to notice is that since kubernetes is maturing to a mainstream technology more organizations are slowly moving up the cloud native stack leveraging kubernetes apis and interfaces so like i said kubernetes has become boring so they are looking to go to something that's more fun and interesting to work on now this is particularly apparent with runtime containers like container d and cryo like i think all of you must have heard of the container d project by now a uh, service mesh like envoy and linkerd and monitoring tools like prometheus given that there is a 43% increase in prometheus adoption and 53% for fluentd adoption it shows that organizations are looking to tap into open source technologies since prometheus and fluentd they are all open source technologies to advance their observability practices and capabilities so since a lot of the cncf projects are open source almost all of them uh we can see that organizations are looking to adopt those and eventually move into open source technologies one emerging topic in the container space is edge computing 
Now, two out of three edge developers use Kubernetes, and most of this seems to be limited to large and medium-sized organizations right now. IoT, which is the key driver for many edge solutions, is also on a steep trajectory and is expected to grow by approximately 19% per year. This underlying growth of IoT will also continue to propel the total usage of Kubernetes. There are also a lot of exciting challenges in the edge computing space because you have a lot of other constraints like memory, CPU, and so on. So if this concept of IoT and edge excites you, I'd highly recommend it to looking into Kubernetes and the edge computing space. Okay, now that we've talked about how Kubernetes adoption is increasing, let's also touch base on some challenges that folks might face while doing so. One big business challenge that organizations face is the lack of expertise. It honestly still takes a steep learning curve to build, deploy, and manage Kubernetes effectively. This is mainly due to the lack of operational precedent with it. Even though we've seen that Kubernetes is being adopted across almost 96% of the organizations, it is still new, it is still a new technology compared to others. So there is a lack of operational precedent with it. To break through these barriers, organizations can take training programs, including CNC and certifications, and work with partner organizations that have specific expertise and solutions. Along the same lines, it's also becoming harder for organizations to hire skilled Kubernetes engineers. But hey, this also means that if you are a Kubernetes engineer, it is a very good time to be so because your skills would be in high demand. With more organizations moving to cloud, there seems to be an emerging trend of lack of internal alignment. So with multiple stakeholders involved, decision-making around how to integrate and manage Kubernetes can become difficult. So it is important to set a cloud strategy around various aspects like cloud financial management, operations, security, and compliance. Now, scalability. It's kind of ironic that Kubernetes improves scalability, yet I'm saying that one of the common challenges faced by organizations is in fact scalability. This is mainly due to the complexity of Kubernetes. So most organizations have a hard time with complex installation and configuration. Honestly, if you've tried it doing from scratch yourself, you know how hard it is. But this problem aggravates when there are multiple clouds, multiple policies, and designated users involved. All of this can affect the expansion or scalability of the organization. So how do you solve this? This can be overcome by using a dependable Kubernetes solution or a product. So let's live, dive a little deeper into the security aspects, which according to me is the most fun part. Let me start by saying that Kubernetes itself is not some inherently vulnerability-ridden technology. The security risks affecting it are similar to those that affect most other technologies that are relatively new to users. Now, here are some top security concerns. First one is the possible configuration issues uh, involving container images, namespaces, runtime privileges, or even unnecessary exposure of secrets as they are baked into images because all of this can lead to risk exposures. So handling misconfigurations is very important. Now, security vulnerabilities. I think a lot of you might know that obviously this is a huge cause uh, for uh, risks around security. So security vulnerabilities, what does that include? So it includes exploits on containers like malware installation and privilege escalation, to name a few. Now, these can exist in production, uh, production accessible container registries, and even third-party admission controllers in Kubernetes clusters. Lastly, there are security concerns where organizations think of security only as an afterthought of the Kubernetes implementation. I know we've all been there, but it is very important that we maintain compliance. There are sec security compliance requirements over containers like CIS benchmarks that must be taken into account. There are a lot of other compliance requirements, but I won't be going into detail here. Okay, now that we've seen how the ecosystem looks like today, let's dive deeper into the Kubernetes project itself. What are some of the achievements that we've done over the last year? I'd say one of the biggest one is feature maturity and stability. Like I've been saying, like Kubernetes is becoming more boring. It's been able to get more boring only due to maturity and stability. A lot of the Kubernetes SIGs, SIGs uh, so I've, I'll be talking about SIGs a lot in this presentation. 
Six basically stands for special interest groups, and Kubernetes is divided into small lot of special interest groups with each SIG a uh, special interest group responsible for a particular set of components. Um, anyway, coming back to the point, a lot of Kubernetes SIGs are continuing to drive long-standing beta features to graduate to stable. So some examples that you might have heard of are the IPv4, IPv6 dual stack, which graduated to stable in 1.23. Uh, even the generic ephemeral inline volumes also graduated to stable in 1.23. Now, showing up and sticking around. This sounds like a very simple phrase, but let me explain more on how important it is. Climbing the contributor ladder. The contributor ladder is basically when you start out as a new contributor, like, okay, I want to contribute. Then you start contributing a little more. We call you a member. Once you become a member and you're contributing even more and participating in reviews and other reviews, also trust you as a reviewer, you become a reviewer and so on. So you basically move up a ladder and that's called the contributor ladder. One of the biggest challenges that we've been facing right now is that even though we say that, okay, the Kubernetes project has a lot of contributors, we don't have folks who can who are consistently moving up the contributor ladder. Now let's talk more on how we solve this challenge in some sense. It's still not perfect though. Okay, now coming back to the contributor ladder. So climbing this contributor ladder is a trust building exercise as much as it is a skills one. So sticking around, uh, and we use a phrase called chopping wood and carrying water. It is the main formula for growing leaders in the project. You need to stick around, you need to do the actual work, and you need to show up. Now, how did we kind of solve this problem in a SIG? Let me take the example of SIG docs. So uh, it's an amazing example of an intentional contributor ladder growth effort uh, because they grew their contributor base and their reviewer base in 2021. How did they do that? they introduced a shadow program for pull request handling. So there was a lot of pull requests coming in, but no one was taking a look at it. And new contributors would get rejected because their pull requests were not getting reviewed and it would just like lead on to a huge cycle. So they designated a shadow program and it basically a designated person would be there who would be wrangling these PRs and looking at these PRs on a regular basis. They also set up a shadow program. So there would be a lead who would be doing this and there would be a mentee, or you can think of it as a mentor-mentee system where a lead is doing, they are responsible for the actual work. And there is a shadow who is, uh, who is learning from this lead on how things need to be done. So they introduced a shadow program for PR handling and dedicated more time to being active in the SIGDOC Slack channel and answering questions from new contributors. This eventually helped grow the community. Not only this, they also worked on the leadership transition strategy to bring community members into leadership roles via a specialized six month, it's a six month group mentorship program. From this, they were able to cultivate leaders for the SIG and some of its subgroups adding new coaches and tech leads. In fact, one of them is also from India and we'll see a lot more. Who, who are these people in a minute? Now, every group in Kubernetes has the responsibility to make sure that we're putting a best foot forward with supply chain security. Security is very important for us. In particular though, SIG release, SIG auth and SIG security worked hand in glove to drive sustained efforts in this area, including artifact signing, compliance with SLSA3 standards, and improving the end user security documentation. So our main goal has been to amp up Kubernetes security. Now there are plenty of processes, tools, and policies that are put together in a project life cycle that sometimes eventually need to be phased out for whatever reason. We've seen that in all organizations and it is same. It is also true for the Kubernetes project. Now, a contributor pain point that we've had in the code base by large is Bazel. If you've not used, if you've not used Bazel in the past, be happy for yourself. Uh, it is very complicated to use. Uh, you can, essentially, it's like a build system. So the crews uh, in six testing and uh, SIG release, they put in a lot of time and attention on removing Bazel from core Kubernetes. It still exists in a few parts of the code base in other, like not core Kubernetes, but in other parts, but we're also mm -hmm. planning on removing it there. Uh, and finally, SIG windows, it's had 
it has had amazing progress in growing windows support in the ecosystem with their efforts like majorly defining operational readiness standards for windows now these were all the achievements that the project has done over the last year now looking at all of these there are a few themes or trends let's see what that are, what they are now one is that they we are trying to prioritize on quality why so there's been actually an increase in regression related backports in the last few releases uh, many of these regressions why they are occurring is basically related to actually two two types of changes so one change is to add features or fix unrelated bugs in areas that are too complex and untested kubernetes like i said it's a huge code base and there are some areas that are too complex and understaffed and under tested so there are only few people who know what is actually going on there and sometimes when another contributor comes and changes things it breaks and leads to regressions the other type of change is changes that were intended to be mechanical refactors but then they accidentally ended up modifying behavior now to fix these problems we are tracking the health of existing components and we are developing more specific test plans also when we are adding new reviewers we are being very cautious that okay these reviewers have the necessary experience and they can actually review code properly so we are prioritizing quality above all the other thing uh, for us is growing independent contributors now what does independent really mean so we have a lot different uh, scenario of contributors so there are folks who work uh, on uh, kubernetes on like their day job that's people like me but then there is also the independent contributor base who are not paid to work on kubernetes but they do so on their own time because they like it now we are trying to grow the independent contributor base by connecting folks to jobs So, if you go to the CNCF Jobs website, that is CNCF or Jobs. Io, I repeat, CNCF or Jobs. Io, the job listings also indicate a percentage of time that the employers would support for upstream activities. For example, if I am an employer and I'm listing a job site there, I would say, okay, like if you apply to this job, fifty percent of your time or twenty percent of your time, you can work on upstream Kubernetes. So that way, you can filter out which jobs you want to apply for as well. and this will eventually help grow the contributor base and that's something that we really really want right now another thing is niche contributor documentation so like i said kubernetes is very huge there are a lot of complex areas and with that its contribution documentation also needs to be big and it is pretty big we are starting to take better measures to document more complex areas and keep things up to date uh, we sadly like or uh, we really need to do more uh, i think but we're still getting there uh, honestly if you're looking to contribute to kubernetes writing documentation is an excellent way to get started and finally gone out uh, so it's become an industry wide problem now uh, with the pandemic and so many things happening all over the world it's like i'm sure most of you might have been through burnout at one point or the other unfortunately but we need to solve it together and there are a mix of reasons why contributors are burning out we are still unsure of the exact solution to this problem though uh, but at least we're constantly talking about it in fact we also reduce the release cadence to make it easier and more sustainable for contributors uh, and users and we are keeping our doors open for contributors to have these discussions with us so if you are feeling the symptoms of burnout or if you feel burnt out already feel free to reach out to sigleads or leaders and the kubernetes community and we'll be more than more than happy to talk to you about this now we've also identified some areas of growth opportunities or needs so some six uh let me actually take a step back so we're talking about project health right so how do you define project health so some sigs they have industry wide open source veterans and like these are veterans they worked in open source for a long time they can quickly identify areas of the components that need help they're able to tell stories about what's flourishing and they're pretty quick in doing things so all of those sigs they have better health compared to some others where they are they're slightly newer open source folks so that's totally fine but since different people have different levels of experience there needs to be a standard way to establish universal indicators of project health in a project especially as large and diverse as kubernetes so that is some one area where we are still working on like what 
and trying to define what is project health anyway. We do run annual reports, uh, obviously annually, yearly. So we ask all six to list down uh, some statistics, like how many contributors do you have? Did you help grow these contributors and so on? What features did you uh, work on? How many did you graduate to stable? Things like that. So we're using all of this data to eventually create a, we do create a report called the summary of the annual uh, report basically and it we are trying to get the overall project health summary but there's still more to do so we're, we're trying to define what is the universal indicator of project health now if you've been watching open source news over the last year supply chain security has made headlines according to open ssf and other security groups code reviews are an important piece to putting prioritization on security if you don't do code reviews right bugs can sneak in and vulnerabilities can sneak in so doing code reviews right is very important but with burnout and other factors people not having enough time to work on it it's been hard for us to grow the number of reviewers. So that's another growth area that we've identified that we definitely need more reviewers. We are trying out some strategies right now, but if you have more ideas, feel free to reach out to us and say contributor experience. Now, only a handful of the most active contributors, they will tell you that they're working on 80 to 100% of their time upstream. And in fact, most like what the project needs right now is senior people. So we have a lot of junior folks joining in and we're just totally fine and that's amazing. But you also need an equal number of senior people helping out in the project. But most senior folks, they also have day jobs and they are working in these big companies or small companies. They're just not able to dedicate time to work on open source because they have a ton of other responsibilities. Now we're working with the CNCF governing board to see if we can develop some incentives and long-term strategies uh, to fix this. But having less full-time folks and less senior folks is turning out to be a huge problem to the project. Okay, now finally, let's look in brief about the Kubernetes 1.24 release. Uh, 1.24, it had a strong focus on beta and stable features and it involves some pretty major changes. Let's see what those are. So one of the biggest change is that Docker shim has been removed from Kubelet. So from 1.24 onwards, it is recommended that you move to a container runtime like container D or cryo. Uh, but this change made a lot of noise when it was announced, like Kubernetes no longer supports using Docker as a container runtime. But don't panic, this change has no impact at all for most users of Kubernetes. If you use a managed Kubernetes service, this change should not impact you in any way. If you manage your own cluster and still use Docker as a container runtime, like I said, moving to container D is important, but it's fairly simple to do so, so you don't need to worry too much about it. New beta APIs will also not be enabled in the cluster by default. But remember that this is just the APIs, so, and also, this is only for the new ones. Existing beta APIs and new versions of the existing beta APIs will also continue to be enabled by default. Uh, another interesting thing, so Kubelet offers a new Prometheus metric to allow cluster operators to count out of memory events that happen in each container running in the Kubernetes cluster. Best practice is to set memory limits for each container, but when software does not run as expected, it can reach this limit. And when that happens, the kernel kills the faulty process. So find out exactly what happened is not easy, but this new metric will definitely help there. Now, no secret by default for service account tokens. This change sounds scary, but it only impacts Kubernetes users who use the long lived service account tokens that Kubernetes stores inside secret. So to Kubernetes 1.23, creating a service account in a cluster results in Kubernetes automatically creating a secret with a token for that service account. And this token never expires, which can be useful, but it is also a security issue. So starting with Kubernetes 1.24, these secrets will no longer be created automatically. Now, being able to load a sidecar that checks for the health of persistent volumes is a welcome addition. Now cluster administrators will be able to react better and faster to events like a persistent volume being deleted outside of Kubernetes. This will absolutely increase the reliability of Kubernetes clusters. 
I'd also like to take a minute to celebrate some Kubernetes contributors from India. Uh, Dims was another prolific Kubernetes contributor, also did a version of this in KCB Bengaluru 2020. I wanted to do a follow-up on it. So while working on this, I realized that we have a lot of new contributors who joined us in the last year. Uh, so this is in absolutely no particular order, uh, but let us see who they were. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with Tarupia, who is also from Chennai. He has contributed to the E2E framework and a few cluster API libraries. Anubha, I could not find a picture of them, uh, but they have been instrumental in SIG contributor experience and SIG docs. Nikhil has a lot of PRs to his name in QBuilder. Sainthani, who's also one of my favorite contributors, she's worked on cluster API providers. Neha works on the Gateway API. Karthik Sharma has contributed to storage and CSI related projects. Uh, Devi Brada is also one of my favorite contributors and he's been taking leadership roles in SIG contributor experience. Harsha has contributed to the E2E framework. Lurkan, Dipto, Gitika, Ashutosh have worked on cluster API and its providers. Priyanka Sagu has taken leadership roles and release teams. She's also a the enhancement uh, lead. So she is the lead for making sure what all features get into 1.25. Uh, she is also mentoring a few other folks to take this leadership role in the next few releases. Aditi is a very, very prolific Signode contributor from India. Okay, I won't go through all of these names here because they were also talked about in previous KCDs. Uh, I would like to give a shout out to Divya, who is uh, leading SIG Docs as well. Uh, but yeah, it's very nice to see so many people contributing from India and I hope you all also consider joining in as well. I'd love to see your faces and your name included in the slides uh, next year. So yeah, if you want to get involved in any specific area, so I talked about QBuilder, I talked about CSI, I was cluster API, so there's a variety of projects. Please feel free to reach out to these folks. Um, if also happy like, to answer any questions myself, so please feel free to reach out to me as well. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Hope you enjoyed the talk. And like I said, please feel free to reach out to me for any questions, even after the conference, you can find me on Kubernetes Slack uh, if you just search my name. So yeah, thank you again and hope